always late from a food vendor to an architect of newborn. We were 11 siblings, as you can see in this picture, very uh, closely knit family. And uh, we lived in a very unassuming environment in Kariako at those times, over 60 years ago. Uh, my father was a taxi driver. He provided for us. And my mother did a little small time catering to augment the economy, the income of the house. But fate was not in our favor. And my father, who had this Premji taxi, died in a taxi accident at Kigogo Bridge and left 11 mouths and one mother to be fed by the mother alone. So we continued. Life wasn't, uh, it, was not, it was not the end of the life. So my mother did a lot of catering now, more than ever. We did the catering, Vitumbua, Mandazi, Kalimati, Biryani, Bajia, and many other things, all for augmenting the income. And in my family, everybody participated. The elder brothers would pound the rice into flour. The other brother would make the dough for mandazi. The sister who is sitting here, one of them, she would sieve the flour, and so on and so forth. Everybody would participate in the family economy. And this way, we all grew up. But I had, as a younger sibling and as a boy, we used to do the selling out. The, late, the girls would work at home, but we would be carrying our basketfuls of kitumbua and mandazi. And we would go to the mosque first, as a first station, to sell those. And after that, we would go house to house to solicit customers. You can see this girl? She's sitting right there. So we would, we would go house to house to solicit. And one of, sometimes one of the house uh, owner would say, oh, what the hell? Why you wake me up in the morning? And then we said, sorry. And then you go to another house. Where have you been? My guests are all waiting. We need this Kitumbua and Mandazi. So it all depended on what was uh, going on. So we had to only go home after we finished selling the Vitumbua and Mandazi and deliver the empty baskets to mom with the coins of money which we get from selling those. That always made me late to school. And we would climb the sewage pipes in order to reach the classroom through the window so that we could, you should not be getting corporal punishment in schools. At that time, it was rampant. So I was always late, but with a purpose. I did my O-levels and then went into A-levels at Pugu Secondary School, very far. Very far at those times, because there were no uh, sufficient roads like what you have now. So at Pugu Secondary, we used to go down into the valley in the Minaki Valley between the Pugu Secondary, which is St. Francis, and Minaki Secondary, which was the school where the father of the nation, whom we honor today, used to teach. They were opposite each other. So we went at the valley to collect water for drinking. It would take me a long time to climb up. I discovered later that my loss of stamina is because of my thalassemia. But anyway, that's another story another day. We would see the water with microorganisms floating there. So we would sieve that in, 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 uh, in towels. Those towels actually give, they can, lead, they can allow viruses to go on. And I developed jaundice after some time. The jaundice was so severe that I was moribund and admitted at Mwimbili Medical Center. After three months of recuperating and recovery, I went back to Pugu Secondary School and I was barred from the school because the terminal exams were over and because all the other exams were over and it was not like what you have now. You have a leeway of an ED, of a doctor's letter, nothing of that kind in those days, 50 years ago or more. So I was now a dropout from A-levels. I was late to go into my A-levels, but there was a purpose. I then did not leave. I persevered. I said, I have to do these A-levels by any means, because that's the only step to go further. So I did tuitions, as you can see. I did private tuitions, uh, physics with Mr. Khan at Mzizima, chemistry with Mr. Fernandez at uh, Tambaza, biology with Mrs. D'Souza at uh, Forodani, 
met with Mr. Thomas at Chamar Robert, and so on and so forth. While I was doing those tuitions, I also had to do the catering, and I had to also work in order to augment the family income. So I worked at DT Dobby as a clerk. And as a clerk, I used to be very proud to register Toyotas and, and Mercedes and big shots come and I give them the card and sir, this is your car, this is your car. And I would try to ignite for them and get some tips. And that's, I worked at DT Dobby for three years while I did my tuitions for A-levels. But that did not deter me, I, I, I went on to study. Three years down the lane, my mother fell very sick. And she had to be operated for some gynecological problem. I don't know what it was because I wasn't a doctor then. And we had to take a loan from a good Samaritan to get her operated. So while mom is in the hospital, very sick, I have to do tuitions, go work at Diti do the catering job at home. I was always late to visit her with a handful of her iron clothes and food. And I would go near her bed and say, Mom, I'm sorry, I'm late. And she would hold my hand. <sighs> sorry. In her deathbed, she would hold my hand and say, Soma monangu soma. Soma monangu soma means study, my son, study. Don't worry about being late. Those words echo into my ear to date. Soma monangu soma. She, she left the world at that time. And here we are all alone. One fine day, the same good Samaritan holds my finger and says, go to India and study. Can you imagine somebody going to India to study? No university, no admission, no accommodation, no money in your hand, just a few little coins. So I went with a one-way ticket to India and I have gone through numerous hardships, inhuman sometimes, unbelievable, but the perseverance and hard work was so strong and there was an oversight God was in my favor. Every time I faced any disaster, there was some help or the other coming in. I persisted and persevered and finished my MBBS degree at, this, at the MKCG Medical College with a lot of accolades. But while I was studying there in the school, uh, in the campus there was a primary school where I saw two boys, were two, one girl and one boy, brother and sister, they were desperate and crying in the morning. And I said, what happened in the Oriya language, which I learned? He said, oh, you know, we don't have English textbook and we have to copy all these things and we have to finish assignment and we can't afford to go for tuitions. Ah, I said, this is another Karim. So I said, from now on, I'm not going for any Hindi movies, which was my favorite because it's the only pastime there. And from now on, I will teach you English. So every morning I went for tuitions to teach them English. Some other children gathered and therefore I would be late in the class. I would always be late in the class. And my teachers knew it. They said, always late, but with a purpose. I finished my MBBS and I came back home. And I said, at home, I joined as Masters in Pediatrics. Masters in Pediatrics, was another feast, another feat to undertake at Mwimbili in those times in the early 80s. But when I was working as a resident in pediatrics, I discovered that newborn babies were dying by the score. They were dying in huge numbers every day. And nobody cared about it because Batimbaya, Sori Ziki, like that was the norm uh, statements and I said, no, it should not be so. So I was uh, hurt because I was seeing all these babies dying and uh, irrespective whether it was a, a Hindu or a Christian or a Muslim or a colored or African, they were all human beings. They were children, they were innocent. They had no speech. 
I had to do something. So after I finished my master's, I went and did my uh, fellowship in neonatal medicine and at the Royal College of uh, Postgraduate Medical School in London. And it was late because it took three years to finish master's and two, one and a half years for the fellowship. So I was late, but I had a purpose. I had a purpose of saving newborn lives. When I came back, among the other neonatologists in the unit, we started working there, and it was like one-to-one. -one. A baby who is sick, you fix drips, you treat the child and go one-to-one, one-to-one, one-to-one. It was too exhausting, actually. Something has to be done more broadly. So I said, it's not always late. I think we must do something more global, more broader. I went to Harvard School of Public Health to do my master's in public health and learned many skills that doing a, a research or doing something to open the eyes of the policymakers and things are the way to go forward. So I finished my master's in public health at the Harvard, and people said, why didn't you stay over there, man? America, land of opportunity. I said, no, I have a purpose. Although I'm late already, so many babies dying, but I have a purpose. I went home and I did the situation analysis of the newborn. When I presented this in a launch at the Ministry of Health, I think uh, Shafiq was there in that launch. Uh, it's uh, the, now what is called the Serena. And when I presented this, people started crying. And I said, this is uh, the right move. And the chief medical officer, Dr. Deom Tasiwa, and the principal secretary, Dr. Mbando, they promised that they will start a neonatal desk where my colleague, Dr. Msemo, became the first director. And from then on, the regional health management team received the funding for newborn babies in all the regions in the country. We were only six neonatal units in the country then. Now, we have 67 neonatal units in the country. The neonatal mortality, <laughs> the neonatal mortality was 56 per thousand. Now the neonatal mortality is 19. I learned <laughs> that it is not enough only to do papers and things, it is actually for you to be there. Like what Mother Teresa said, I don't want your money, I want you. That's what I followed, that it's not the money. My own leader, Aga Sistani, he said to me that if you want to do what the prophet did, go and serve the poorest of the poor, and you will see you will succeed in this world and hereafter too. I hope so. And therefore, I continued working in the neonates. Come 2015, things turned a bit. I had a major surgery in my back due to degenerative issues in the back and ankylosing spondylosis. So if you see me in the morning, I'm miserable. My back is very stiff. I can't walk. I have to do a little exercise, take a painkiller, and then start work. So. Come 2015, after the surgery, I'm always late for the journal club. I'm always late for the case presentation. I'm always late for the lectures in the morning at 7.30. But there is a purpose. Despite all that, I would say no stopping there. I joined the NEST 360 program for the newborn babies. I have, I'm a consultant at WHO doing a lot of newborn babies research. One of my researchers is sitting right there near my daughter-in-law. Dr. Ayman, and so on and so forth. So I continued there to become the national best health scientist in 2016. But I was always late with a purpose. Then after uh, doing this, I said one more thing. In order to do better, you need to capacity build. So we started a neonatal fellowship course. And we started in 2021 a neonatal course for fellowship. So this year, four graduates in homebred neonatologists, among others, will now join the team of neonatologists in Tanzania. And in 2021, the Lancet profiled me as an architect of newborn care in Tanzania. So guys, persevere, persist, and do the hard work. And God will help you. From a food vendor with Kitumbu and Mandazi, to the architect of newborn in Tanzania. That's me. And thank you all for listening to me and giving me this opportunity. Santeni san. <laughs>